So, Bruce, how did you end up going to USC for college? Um, primarily, my brother Clay went there and had a great experience, and I became a huge fan of SC, so that was it. Were the other colleges recruiting you back then? Yeah. Um, I mean, I pretty much – I was getting recruited heavily, but, uh, I mean, my intention was if SC offered – that's where I wanted to go. I mean, they were defending national champions. It's, it was a half hour from our house, from where we grew up. And like I said, my brother had a great experience there. I went to all his home games and um, became a huge fan. So was Coach Robinson the main one recruiting you back then? Yes. What was it like to play for Coach Robinson at USC? Um, I... To this day, I have a great deal of respect for Coach Robinson and, and the type of head coach that he was. And it was, you know, as an 18-year-old kid going in there, uh, he really made a big impact on my life. And um, it was not to say that uh, other coaches were different, but I think at that time of my life, it really made an impression in terms of uh, how – he just emphasized no individual is bigger than the team. And we had some huge individuals. We had Charles White, Marcus Allen, and, you know, Ronnie Lott and Anthony Munoz. And, and as a young player, it was apparent to me that all those guys had completely bought into the way he Coach Robinson did business. And, and I, I just had great respect for him. And like I said, to this day, I still have great respect for him. Everybody talks about the Pittsburgh offensive lines in college back in the 80s with Russ Grimm and uh, those guys. But you guys, your line was pretty thick with you. Like you said, Munoz, you had Keith Van Horn. I think you could you – know, basically, you were the top two offensive lines in the college back then. Yeah, we uh, – my freshman year, we had six – future number ones just on the offensive line. Um, Anthony Munoz, Brad Buddy, Keith Van Horn, Roy Foster, Don Mosbar, and myself. And um, yeah, it was they, all those guys taught me about what it really meant to practice hard and to play hard. And, you know, you tend to get a, a higher opinion of yourself than reality kind of dictates and you know being around those guys and seeing the professionalism at such an, a young age to me uh really had a huge impact on my career so that's what made marcus allen and charles white so good was the line i guess anyone could have ran behind those lines i uh, i'll give them their credit they were <laughs> special players but uh i think we helped out a little bit so in 79, you guys go to USC goes two and two, 80, 12th place, 13th place. Did you think you were going to win a championship when you went to USC? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, going in there, I remember thinking, man, these guys are pretty good, you know, not only on the offensive line, but at every position group. And um, again, I, I had no idea in terms of uh, history like what these guys would turn out to be and stuff. and But, again, as a, a young freshman, it was like, well, I guess that's what it's like at every school. And I immediately came in my first year, and we were blowing teams out, and I was playing the better part of the second half in most of the games. And then, uh, uh, unfortunately, we tied Stanford. We were up 21 nothing, and they came back. And um, I thought that's just how it was going to work for four years. And, um, yeah, I, I thought at some point we'd definitely win a championship, but it didn't work out that way. John Elway probably reminds you of that 79 game all the time. You know what's funny is uh, he – I know he played in the game, but it was uh, Turk Schoner who did the uh, the lion's share of the comeback and stuff. And as I recall, Elway didn't have that great of a game. But, uh, yeah, it uh, it was 
one of many comebacks I've been involved with. And fortunately or unfortunately, it ended up in a tie. Did you have any idea? Would, Go ahead. I would have been hard pressed to think that anybody would have beaten us that year had we had the opportunity. I think Alabama won it, but you know, I'm biased, of course, but uh, I think we'd have beat up on Alabama that year. In fact, the year before, SC went down to uh, Birmingham and crushed Alabama. But anyway, I digress. What was your next question? Did you have any idea that Houston was going to draft you in the first round? Um, yes and no. Uh, they had expressed interest. And um, it was the only idea of what I thought. Uh, Bill Parcells was the new Giants coach in uh, 83. And uh, at the Tampa Combine that year, he came up to me and introduced me or introduced himself to me and said if, that I, if I was available at number 10, the Giants were drafting me. And, you know, it was a thrill. And, you know, I've always been a Bill Parcells fan as a result. But um, the Oilers traded, made a couple deals that year and moved back to nine and took me. And um, so I wasn't surprised, but, you know, I wasn't bank- banking on it either. What was your coach like on um, Phillips your first year? Actually, it was Eddie Biles. Oh, um, and yeah, Bomb was about a year, two years removed. But uh, you know, I'm I stay in contact with Eddie, uh, see him all the time at charity events down here. Uh, after he was done with the Oilers, he stayed in the area, and um, you know. For me as a rookie, it was everything was so new and cool. Uh, I was walking around like on cloud nine, like, man, they actually pay me to play football. So I don't know that uh, any coach would have had a different impact or um, on that that first year, especially because it was just such a thrill to be to be there. You had a pretty good running back in Earl Campbell when you joined him, who was still in the prime of his career. Right. Uh, Again, one of the highlights of my career, um, playing with Earl. Um, I played a year and a half with him. He he rushed for like 13, 1400 yards my rookie year and, you know, missed a bunch of time due to injury. And, you know, it, it was, as a kid who grew up, in complete awe of the NFL experience, uh, to to get to know him a little bit and to um, to see, you know, he was a legit guy. That whole persona, the country boy persona, I mean, that guy's genuine. And it really was an honor to play with him, and it's something I'm really proud of. How did it change when Jerry Glanville became your coach? Uh, there were pluses and minuses, obviously. I I think the biggest plus is Jerry did a great job of taking a team that had the talent and making us believe. And we played hard under Jerry. And really, to his credit, <clears throat> every team that he coached, when we, we played the Falcons uh, years later when he took the job after – leaving us um and then you know the only negative i think sometimes is uh you don't ever want to empower the enemy and make those comments and um where i mean yeah teams they're going to give you their best shot regardless but you don't want to give them anything that may be bulletin board material or something along those lines and you know, he he inflamed some of our opponents, or most, should I say. But, man, to his credit, uh, 
he took a team like a sleeping giant and woke us up and um, was a huge part of um, getting us on that big playoff run we had in the late 80s, early 90s. I think the GM was pretty smart putting together that offensive line because if you win and lose with the offensive line, you had you, Mike Munchak, you had Dean Steinkuhler, Ken Hill. You guys were pretty loaded at line. Yeah, uh, it's been interesting that this, there have been teams that have uh, tried to use that model. And um, some of those high number ones didn't hit. But it's been cool to see, like, the Cowboys. They, they basically use that model, and it's paid huge div- dividends for the Cowboys with uh, – Zach Martin and Frederick and Tyron Smith and uh, it, it it reminds me of that that Oiler team because you know we played a good solid um, nine ten years together and um, it, it's a luxury that you don't appreciate until you don't have it. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's taken for granted when you have quality offensive line play because so much of the credit goes to the quarterback and receivers and running back and rightfully so. But then all of a sudden when you have those holes in the O line, uh, the good old days definitely seem uh, they're definitely missed, I, I guess I should say. I mean your whole offense changed when Warren Moon came in and you brought in that run and shoot. Was it difficult to go from like a running team to more of a passing team as an offensive lineman? Yeah, it really June Jones was kind of the architect of that in 87 when they came in and you know, Warren is such a special talent and um, I think it, it really was an offshoot of the talent that we had. We, we could give him time to throw the ball. We had the receiving position. And, and that being said, we still ran the ball well. But, uh, yeah, it definitely put more pressure on the line and on the offense in terms of four-minute situations where you're trying to run the clock out or uh, um, just trying to grind, grind it out, whether it's short yardage or goal line. But um, it was – it was something that we did early on. We would run conventional offense, you know, two one two, um, multiple tight end set, and then we would go as we call it back in the day to the red gun, which was the four wide with the one back. And then over the years, we we worked more and more exclusively to the run and shoot. And then when Jack Purdy came in, we did it full time. Yeah, it definitely did uh, add challenges. To us as linemen, but uh, you know, you always look at it as a challenge and say, "We're going to make this work." Did you have any idea Warren Moon was to become the great quarterback that he did? Um, I think we all struggled. Uh, he came in my second year in the league, and uh, we were a young team. We were talented, but we were emerging, and you could see why they went out and got him and he would make those throws and and really like i said earlier when june jones came in and really started to utilize warren's talents and i mean he was a special guy and the thing i think that most gets overlooked on warren is his durability and he did a great job of preparing himself for the season, being in the best shape he could be, obviously doing the mental side of it. And, you know, he, he was a pro about it. And um, you, I think that tends to get overlooked. But for me, as time has passed, and you see those quarterbacks that can stay healthy, whether it's Favre or uh, Brady or guys like Warren, man, that's, that is a gift that they have and um, it's little things that are taken for granted that really not until they're gone do you appreciate them. 
You mentioned the comeback game in college. That comeback game against the Bills, was that probably the toughest loss you ever sustained? Uh, yes and no. It, it was hard. It, I mean, I'll be honest. Any time we lost, I couldn't stand it. Um, the, the part of it that wasn't as painful as it probably could have been was the fact that it was such a freakish deal. Um, I mean, yeah, you have teams come back and make plays and maybe get a rally, but you somehow find a way to, to right the ship and you close the deal. And obviously that wasn't the case against Buffalo. And it was almost like, man, this is bigger than us. Than us. You know, this is the one of those once in a lifetime deals. And the funny thing was, um, we had to drive the ball late in the game and to kick a field goal to send it to overtime. And I really thought um, that the fact that, that we persevered right there, the fact that we found a way to make plays in spite of all the points and all the momentum being in their favor, I felt like, man, we're going to win this thing. And we won the, the coin toss in overtime. And um, I think we threw a pick or something and, they go down and win it, and that was that. When you finally made the Super Bowl after so many years in the league, did you think, you know what? I never thought I was going to make the Super Bowl. Again, this is great. And then it's got to be tough to lose in the Kurt Warner in that game. Yeah, same type thing. Um, you know, they completely dominate us in the first two and a half quarters of the game. And then we go and really in Titans fashion, we kind of bludgeon them. And uh, Steve McNair's making just a, amazing plays and keeping plays alive with his legs. And um, we finally get in that position to to score and again send it to overtime. They were done. Um, I. I usually don't watch the videos, you know, come playoff time. They always play it on NFL Network or whatever of uh, the Super Bowl or, for that matter, the Buffalo game. But there's a part of me that during these games, I have a certainty within myself that we're going to win this game, even though I know the facts, I know the history. And um, it's funny, though, because – uh, like even the, the Rams game, they, they have video of defensive players coming off and Dick Vermeil saying to them, you're going to come off with, you know, 50 seconds left in the game. Are you kidding me? You know, but they were done. It, it, would, it would, in my opinion, it was a foregone conclusion that had we gone to overtime, we were going to win because defensively they were toast. and. Uh, Unfortunately, the old one yard short. So, yeah, it was it was a great experience to finally get to the Super Bowl. Um, even the game itself was uh, the culmination of a lot of uh, stuff that the team had gone through because of our move uh, from Houston, and um, you know, it it easily could have gone the other way. So. Yeah, it's still frustrating, I guess, to sum it up. You had the record for most consecutive games played. Was that just luck, or was that your training, or a combination of both? Uh, again, with the added perspective of time and being out of the game and then really coaching in the league for five years, man, I see guys uh, – injured or tweaked or whatever and rightfully so they're sitting out game and i look back on my career and i did i i, I had a, felt a high responsibility uh to be out there every game and i really didn't play in a game where i shouldn't have and i mean there were times i didn't feel 100%, but I knew once I 
got warmed up that I wasn't a detriment to the team, that I was playing at a level that uh, I would be satisfied with how I was playing. And so I look back on it, and, you know, I, we worked out. I did all the workouts. I was very diligent in, in that regard. But I look at it more. It, it's a very humbling thing. I think the good Lord just blessed me with a body that could take the pounding. And he gave me a a, a tolerance for um, pain. But I don't, I don't really, like I said, I don't feel like there ever was a game that I went into where I'm going, oh, my gosh, my leg or my knee or my back or whatever the case might be, it, I shouldn't be out here. I felt good when I got out there. Now, the warming up process or getting into it um, might have taken some effort or some extra special preparation, but I always felt good about it. So I look at it as God bless me, and I'm thankful for that, and it's a humbling thing because – like I said, especially when I got on the coaching side and seeing how many times freak injuries or um, just the weirdest stuff a guy gets hurt on or, or he gets tweaked and, you know, has to miss time. And I was just blessed, you know. I can't think of how many piles I stood around where I got rolled up or the, the pile fell into my leg and um, – I was able to get up and walk away. Your dad was a great lineman in college and in the pros at the 49ers. How helpful was he in your becoming a great offensive lineman? Uh, my dad taught me about how to approach a game in terms of attitude and the right perspective to have. And early on, he, he taught our whole family that um, if you go out there, you don't quit. Uh, you go full speed at everything and, you know, be, be the first guy in line that if the coach asks for a volunteer, raise your hand, you know, tell them, have them make them tell you to, to stop volunteering or whatever the case may be. And that really stuck with me. And, um, I think also, uh, in terms of, he wasn't big on what I did specifically, but uh, like I said, just having that mindset of, of going out and doing my best, it, it really was huge. Was your grandfather a big part of your life too? Uh, my, my grandfather passed when I was 10 years old, and he was a baseball guy. But, uh, you know, he caught all the kids. He was a boxing coach at the Citadel down in Charleston, South Carolina as well. And so he was one of those tough but fair guys. And, uh, you know, that definitely was something that was passed on from my dad to me. And you passed yeah. not to your kid, sure, too, I'm sure. Yeah, I tried to, yeah. Who was the toughest lineman you went up against? Man, it, it's hard for me, and I feel bad sometimes singling a guy out because there have been so many great players that I know whether it was game week prepping for him, that there, there was added anxiety to to having to play him that week. I mean, there always was anxiety for me in terms of my opponents and, and preparing for him, but there definitely were some real special ones. I think of uh, Bruce Smith, Howie Long, uh, John Randall, um, and – I mean, there's, there's so many good ones. The, the cool thing about the NFL is that you're going to be tested every week. And you may not have heard of where this – you may not have ever heard about this guy or what college you might have gone to. But in some unique way or fashion, it may be in the run game, it may be in the pass game, it may be uh, backside cutting off, whatever the case may be. He's got some unique skill or talent that is, if you lower your guard, if you relax or uh, get complacent, they're going to embarrass you. And that's that's the thrill part of the NFL. 
because you know you got to stay on edge the whole game. Um, and that's every week, every position, every guy, first or second string. And it, it's been kind of cool to go through that again with my son and having those conversations about, especially with Jake at left tackle, uh, playing there. There are so many special players and that you have to bring it every play. And and that's one of the biggest, if not the most important trait for an offensive lineman is having that playing consistent. You can't be one of those guys that has eight great plays and then two busts. You got to bring it every play and consistency is is more important than those flash plays where you go and put some guy on his back. That's great. But I would rather have you be consistent 10 plays and have those eight and and two or nine and one play series. You mentioned John Randall. John Randall said one of his best traits was preparation. He would know everything about his opponent, their personal life and things like that and get in their head during games. Did you ever try that with you? Nah. I think by the time uh, I rolled around, you know, there was such an age difference that if he did say anything, I probably ignored it because I was one of those quiet guys. Um, and he, he to me, was entertaining. Same with Sap, you know. I, some of the stuff they'd say, it'd make me laugh. And because um, you're out on the football field, you're trying to keep this edge of, almost hatred towards your opponent because you don't, you don't want to give them any quarter. And uh, all of a sudden they're making these little chips out there. And it's like, Hey, that was pretty clever. You know? Um, yeah. The funny thing was the guys who speak, they do the trash talk. Most of them, it's like, what are you an idiot? You know, the smart ones, it was the quiet ones that you had to worry about. But then occasionally the Randalls, the Saps, those type guys, they actually had some good humor. And, you know, it's such an odd place to to appreciate humor. I mean, you can the next day, but while you're out there in the, the heat of battle, it's something you never really think about. What was it like when you found out you went in the Hall of Fame? Oh, man. Um, I was a huge fan of the NFL growing up. My dad played before I was born, but I was very proud of that fact. Uh, I never hesitated to share it with buddies at school or something along those lines. Uh, When my brother went in the league five years before me, I was so proud of him. You know, naturally, I was a huge Browns fan. Uh, So I grew up with just this great like I was in awe of the league and then the whole 19 years and playing in the league and making the pro bowl and all that type stuff to me it was like man I can't believe this is me that's actually doing this and um, I think in a lot of ways in terms of my faith and how I viewed God's relationship through this whole thing. I I became so much more humble about it in the fact that I realized, man, God blessed me to be able to go out and play this great game. This was nothing that I did on my own. I mean, God gave me the the body and the the desire and, and the mindset and the intellect to play the game. And I became humbled by the whole process. And then, uh, being named to the Hall of Fame, it was it was the culmination of all these things. And it was like, thank you, Lord, for blessing me. I see so much um, of how this is such a group effort from my parents and the example that they set, the, the, the opportunity to grow up with a big brother like Clay. It just, I was so blessed. And... It was a very humbling experience, and um, I was very um, 
apprehensive about the Hall of Fame weekend and stuff because, man, the spotlight's on you for three, four days, four full days. And I remember thinking, man, I just can't wait till this is over because I don't want to be the spotlight anymore. I'm very appreciative. But this amazing thing happened during that weekend. I I got up there and initially started feeling that anxiety about it. Um, but then I saw how much all my friends and family were enjoying the moment. And it really became a culmination, kind of a uh, – the opportunity to see them enjoying the process and the weekend, it, all of a sudden it, it was no longer about me. And I was able to enjoy uh, their response. And it was really cool. And, and again, it, it was just another humility lesson, you know, because I, it was all about me and my anxiety and, oh, I don't want to be the center of attention. And then when I, when I find, when it, I did make it about me, then I enjoyed it. And it's something that I've been out 10 years now, and I remember specifically about it, that I, it became an enjoyable process to me. 